So hi everyone, my name is Laura. I don't know if you can see me, but I am the programming librarian at Portsmouth Public Library. And I don't usually have to say this, but that's Portsmouth Public Library in New Hampshire. So as you probably noticed, this event kind of blew up online. We're really excited to have, it looks like almost 400 people here today. And um, we have a max of 500, so we might reach our capacity, but we're really excited to welcome people from all over England, New England and beyond, it looks like. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about how tonight's going to go. Um, Russ Cohen will be giving a presentation, but we're going to keep everybody on mute because um, it would obviously be pretty chaotic to have everybody on their microphones. So what we'd like you to do is if you can put your questions in the chat, um, my colleague Robin, who is also here, and I will ask Russ those questions at the end. Does that work for everybody? Does that work for you, Russ? It certainly does. Okay, great. Um, so we're so excited to have Russ Cohen here after he was recommended to us by a number of different local folks. Um, we know that everybody's taking more walks right about now. So I, for one, am excited to learn more about the foods that I can look for on those walks. Um, and Russ Cohen is recently retired, but he served as the Rivers Advocate for the Massachusetts Department of Fish and Games Division of Ecological Restoration. Um, so I think he'll probably tell us a little bit more about himself, but please join me in welcoming Russ tonight. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Russ. Oh, thank you, thank you. So this is wild to be thing here in the guest room of my house in the second floor in Arlington, Massachusetts, talking to you from so many different places. Um, as you may or may not know, this is a, a replacement for what was supposed to be an in-person talk earlier this week where I was actually going to show up at the library and talk to people in person. So uh, sorry we can't do that. Um, uh, the major drawback from seeing me online and not meeting with me in person, edible treats, I love to serve to my audiences. So I will be showing you photos of those and I will be providing recipes uh, in the handouts that I provided, Robin, or that are posted on my webpage and I'll get to that at the end of the talk. So there are recipes. Um, so sorry, I can't share you in person the actual uh, yummy goodies that I love to make from wild foods. So we'll just have to talk about them and and uh, and have that virtual, you know, little tasting going on online. All right. So, and uh, I assume everybody can see my title slide: Edible Wild Plants in and Around Portsmouth. So. You know, had this been an in-person talk, the people in the audience would be from in and around Portsmouth. So it would be definitely regionally appropriate to you, which is like how I like to do my talks. But uh, I understand we've got an audience drawing from a much larger area. So uh, for those of you that are concerned, am I going to learn anything? Yes, you absolutely will. Many, many, many of the plants covered in this talk grow uh, all over the region, if not uh, all over the world. So uh, you will find at least something that applies to you. But this will be particularly useful for the people that are from in and around Portsmouth. So uh, anyway, so, um, so for those of you, when we get to some of the coastal stuff, if you're not from the coast, you might find it less relevant, at least to apply in immediate basis. Hopefully when all this is over, we can all go anywhere and then you will be able to come to the coast and see some of the seaweeds and stuff like that I'm talking about. All right, so before I plunge into the show, I just wanted to cover a couple foraging uh, uh, ground rules and just basic things uh, that uh, might have crossed your mind. Um, like, for example, just how risky is it to put a wild plant in your mouth? Could you get sick? Could you even die? And the answer, and I have to qualify my answer and say it applies to New England or this region of the Northeastern US. I can't uh, make this claim the world over or even the nation over, but at least for this region, I'm happy to say that the chance of you getting very seriously poisoned or dying from eating a wild plant is relatively low as long as you follow one basic principle, and that is not to eat plants that taste bad. It's because the vast majority of our poisonous plants that grow in this region taste horrible. So my advice is don't eat plants that taste bad. It doesn't mean that every edible wild plant is gonna be delicious straight from the bush or the vine or whatever, 
a lot of them require some kind of advanced preparation, but if you are pretty sure that you've identified a plant that you think is edible, that you remember from the show, read about in a book, or somebody else taught it to you, whatever, you think you've got the right thing, you bring it home, you prepare it according to instructions, you've got a big steaming plate of it in front of you, and you take a bite and it doesn't taste good, you might not want to override that danger signal your taste buds might be giving you. You might have made a mistake in identification. So uh, there are a few exceptions, notorious exceptions to the poisonous plants taste bad rule. And two of those plants are poison hemlock and water hemlock. These are plants in the carrot or parsley family and they have large fleshy tap roots that look sort of like a carrot. And apparently those don't taste bad enough for people to eat them by mistake and get very sick or possibly even die. Poison hemlock, poison hemlock is a plant that Socrates uh, drank a tea from and died from. So we're talking about seriously poisonous plants. Uh, so uh, that is the one family, the carrot or parsley family that I, even though I've been foraging for over 40 years, I still tread very lightly when uh, gathering plants from that family because the, the um, consequences of making a mistake are, are rather severe. All right, but um, in general, I don't worry too much about uh, uh, people eating other poisonous plants by mistake because, as I said, uh, the vast majority of them taste horrible. And uh, I'm also happy to say that uh, the body has some natural mechanisms in place that will, uh, frankly speaking, will uh, induce you to poop out or puke out the poison before it causes any serious damage. But I, I also wanna say that I did not learn this stuff by walking down the trail, popping stuff in my mouth and see what happens. I am benefiting from the uh, accumulated knowledge acquired over centuries, uh, like Native Americans, for example. Of course, they are the original uh, knowledge keepers of how uh, the, you know, they figured out, um, before there are any uh, other people on the scene, what plants, in, in indigenous native plants of this region were edible. And so uh, we can all benefit from that accumulated knowledge. Um, but let's say, for example, that uh, you see a plant and you're very, you're, you're, you're really quite sure that it's edible, but a little, a very brief taste will confirm you've got the right thing or not. And so, um, and I'm not talking about plants that can cause contact dermatitis like poison ivy, things like that, but things where you actually have to ingest a poison to get you into serious trouble. If you take a, a small amount of a plant and you put it in your mouth just for a second or two, just to taste it, to see if it has the taste you're expecting it to taste. If it didn't and you spit it out right away, uh, even if it were a poisonous plant, just spitting it out right away, the worst that's likely to happen is that you feel nauseous for a little while, and that's probably because you scared yourself to death more than anything. So once again, I don't make a habit of this. I don't walk down the trail and pop stuff in my mouth and see what happens and say, oh, does this taste good? Therefore, it's edible. No, no, I'm pretty damn sure I know that the plant that I'm thinking of eating is edible before I think about putting it in my mouth. But um, but do think of your taste buds as a backup identification tool. Now, we don't have time to cover uh, edible wild mushrooms in this talk. It's also something I love to do, gather wild mushrooms. And um, in some of my other talks that I do in person and online do cover mushrooms, just not this one. But I do want to stress that the risk of picking and eating the wrong species of mushroom and getting very sick and even dying is much, much greater than for plants. And the reason is, there are a bunch of mushroom species out there with toxins, including some that are potentially lethal. And for a lot of those species, there's absolutely no indication from the flavor that there's anything to worry about. So you could have this delicious mushroom meal one day and be dead several days later from liver or kidney failure. So um, yeah, so you have to be much more careful with mushrooms than for plants. Uh, and when I talk about mushrooms in my talks, I explain you know a little bit more about uh, how to do it safely and so on. But we're gonna talk about just plants today, so I'm not gonna mention mushrooms again for the rest of the show. All right, so uh, next topic is allergies. It is possible to be allergic to an edible wild plant. I mentioned that at the beginning. Yeah, I do not have a camera on my computer, so you get to look at my slides instead, which I think is more instructive than just seeing me. So uh, I'm gonna be about five minutes longer with these general remarks, and then we're gonna spend the rest of the time actually going through pretty pictures of edible wild plants. It's just, there's some beginning stuff that I need to cover at the beginning. I hope you all understand that. 
All right, so back to allergies. So it is possible that you could be allergic to an edible wild plant or mushroom and simply not know it just because you've never been exposed to that particular species before. And so the standard advice is to not eat a huge amount of some new food you're trying for the first time, just to make sure you're not gonna break all out in hives or whatever. But if you're not generally allergic to conventional vegetables or fruits, it's unlikely you'd be allergic to their wild counterparts because chemically they're very similar. All right, so now let me talk about conservation. I, I um, like to bring my conservation ethic with me in the field when I think about gathering wild plants and I encourage you to do that too, especially when you're gathering native species because native species often have important roles in the ecosystem. Animals rely upon them for food or some other important portion of their life cycle. So when you're gathering native species, uh, you would never want to pick so much that you could alter the ecological balance. So I encourage people to use some forbearance and restraint when gathering native species. And I'll get into a little bit detail on that when I get into specific species. Um, so that's native species, but there is another group of plants that you can relax a lot more about. So now I'm gonna talk about that. So we have edible weeds and invasive species. So although this talk is based in Portsmouth and you see that there's information on New Hampshire invasive plants in the lower right corner, I'm just gonna talk about this document from Massachusetts, which came out about 10 years ago. And it talks about the 66 species of invasive plants that are considered to be most ecologically disruptive in Massachusetts. So ecologically, these species are bad news. And, and, and just in case you don't know, uh, one of the main bad things that invasive plants do is they usurp the habitat from the native plants. They take it away from them. So uh, if there is a silver lining to the invasive cloud, perhaps it's the fact that some of these plants are edible. In fact, out of the 66 species covered in this book, at least 20 of them are edible. And as far as at least most ecologists are concerned, they would be thrilled if we picked and ate as many of these invasive species as we possibly could, provided that we're not spreading them around in the process. So I'm totally serious about this. They represent guilt-free foraging. You can't pick too many edible invasive species. Just make sure you don't spread them around in the process, but that is usually easily avoidable. So here's a bunch of yummy invasive species that grow in New England, and I will be covering seven, several of these in the show today. So, um, and, um, and I would lump in with this category also the common weeds too, a lot of which are in my show, like dandelion and chicory and burdock. These are very, very common wild plants that you can harvest uh, with a clear conscience, you don't have to worry about any ecological disruptions from gathering them. So, um, so with that said, let's plunge into the show. Okay, so if this were a live audience, I would say, what is this? And of course, a lot of you would chime in and say fiddleheads. But that alone is not enough to know if this is an edible fiddlehead because almost all ferns go through this stage in the spring. And a very common novice mistake that uh, foragers make at least in this region, is they'll be hiding in the woods in spring and they'll see ferns curled up like that and they'll say, oh, fiddleheads, boy, that looks an awful lot what I've seen for sale in the stores. It must be the same thing. So they pick it and they bring it home and they cook it up and they eat it and it tastes horrible and they say, oh, where do we go wrong? Where they went wrong? All right, so this is the ostrich fern. This is, in fact, the species of fern that you do see for sale in the stores. And it does grow wild here in New England. And I'm going to teach you the five ways to distinguish the ostrich fern from any other species of fern. The first thing you want to look for is the habitat. Ostrich ferns tend to grow in alluvial floodplain soil, as you see in this photo here. So this is a photo taken along the Connecticut River in western Massachusetts, but you could see a similar scene along the Merrimack River. Um, so not right in Portsmouth itself, but not far from Portsmouth. So you want to be in the right habitat. And then let's go back to the fiddlehead. So this is a great example. Uh, the conservation ethic that I talked about at the beginning of my talk is applicable here. So I encourage people when they're harvesting these fiddleheads to pick just one or two of the little curled up parts per clump, that's it. Let the rest alone, allow them to grow out. That is a totally sustainable way of harvesting the species because if you get greedy and you pick every one of those fiddleheads see in the base of the plant, the plant will hold a couple in reserve as backups 
And if those grow up to replace the ones that were picked and somebody goes into the woods after you a week or two later and they pick the ones that have grown out, the, the reserve ones, you're taking a lot of strength away from that plant. You could actually kill the plant by harvesting it that hard. So if you take just one or two of these cold up parts per clump, that's a sustainable way of harvesting this plant. All right, also ways to identify this species. You see that the cluster grows in a vase-shaped clump and that in the inside of the stalk is a little trough, kind of like the inside of a celery stalk. So if you cut it in cross section, it forms a U shape. And then this business right here, these papery scales that cover the croziers, the wound up fiddlehead part, they flake off really easily, uh, come off with your fingers. Uh, so it's not like a wool, like a, a cinnamon fern, which is a, a lookalike to this species. And then the last thing to look for are these things. These are called the fertile fronds or the spore bearing fronds. And uh, you won't see these with every clump of ferns, but you will see them uh, where the fiddleheads are like. And if you cut these little uh, fertile fronds in cross section, you see they also form a U. So this is what, uh, you can really see the vase shape on these clumps as these grow out. So that's our ostrich fern fiddlehead. And if you've ever bought fiddleheads at the store and been disappointed by the flavor, uh, you might wanna try this technique for eating them. I analogize this to sweet corn. So um, you, know, you wanna minimize the amount of time between when you uh, pick the sweet corn and when you uh, cook it up and eat it. And this was demonstrated very well by this naturalist, Beth Basler, who took a bunch of us to a patch of ostrich ferns growing along the Connecticut River, Northfield, Mass. And she brought her camp stove with her to the fiddlehead patch. And we were eating those fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them. And they were truly exquisite that way. All right, here is another native species called the marsh marigold. And this is probably what it looks like in New Hampshire right now with these beautiful yellow flowers. So this is one of our classic spring ephemeral wildflowers. And, uh, and it's a plant that, um, it would be, it, it would be uh, totally understandable if you said, that's too pretty. I don't want to pick that plant. It's not very common where I live, so I'm not going to harvest it. And I would totally support you in that. Um, I included in my show a little bit more of historical interest than anything practical today because uh, of a couple reasons. First of all, remember that... Um, before World War II, uh, it was kind of unusual for people to be able to get green vegetables anytime they wanted to. Uh, now we're sort of spoiled. Uh, but back then, you know, people were living off things from the root cellar or, uh, you know, stuff they had put up. Uh, and so when green plants were growing in the spring, people would eagerly seek them out. And so the marsh marigolds and the... Uh, Ostrich ferns are two of our native uh, edible species that were sought after, especially for people that lived in rural areas in the spring. Now for marsh, marsh marigold, you need to eat the leaves before the flowers come out and you absolutely have to boil them to make them safe to eat. They're actually poisonous raw. In fact, I would even encourage changing the water once or twice to make sure that you've dispelled all the toxic principles and then uh, the texture and flavor of the cooked marsh marigold leaves is very, very similar to spinach. And you might say, I'll just grow the spinach or I'll just go buy the spinach at the store. And once again, I would totally support you in that. But, um, you, uh, but marsh marigold is out there. And so I encourage people, if you're going to harvest this one from the wild, to take one or two leaves per clump. That's it. And that's a sustainable level. And I have seen places where marsh marigolds will grow by the thousands of fields. So if you're seeing a really large patch like that, even if you're just taking one or two leaves per plant, that's still enough to uh, you know, give you a nice side dish. And yes, uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, uh, I have an edible native plant nursery outside of Boston where I'm propagating over a thousand plants, including this marsh marigold, which I've grown from seed and it's fun and it's pretty easy and you want to gather the seed in June and um, yeah, and you could sow it right away or you can store it in the fridge and then sow it the following spring. And there it is. There's the marsh marigold that I grew from seed in my nursery. All right, so here's a plant. This has wide applicability to just about everybody in the show. This is a plant that you could recognize even in the dark. This is a plant you could recognize even if you're blind. Why is that? Because it is stinging nettle. 
So if you've never been stung by stinging nettle, it's not like poison ivy where you find out only a day or two later that you got into it. If you get stung by stinging nettle, you know right away. But the good news is the sting rarely lasts more than an hour and is an antidote to the sting that I'm going to teach you in just a second. So anyway, this is one of the first plants I'm harvesting in the spring. And typically what I do is just take the very top cluster of each plant off, just that bit right there. And nettles often grow in large patches, so you can gather hundreds of these. Then I bring them home and I'll get out a bowl of water and throw the nettle tops in there and just stir them around with a wooden spoon just to clean them off. And then I'll get some tongs and I'll fling the nettle tops into a cooking pot and I'll steam the nettle tops in more or less the water that's still clinging to them from the washing process. And, uh, and the nettle greens will shrink quite a bit, as you see here. So once you steam the nettle greens like this, uh, the um, sting, the chemical that causes the sting in the raw plant is converted into a protein. So it makes the plants about 7% protein, which is pretty high for leafy green vegetable. Plus nettles have all kinds of other, other vitamins in them and minerals like calcium. So nettles are the closest thing I know of to the plant world, to a vitamin pill in the plant world. They're really good for you. So you could eat the steamed nettle greens just plain if you wanted to. The flavor is sort of like split peas or you can incorporate them into different dishes. So in my foraging book, I have a recipe for cream of stingy nettle soup, which sounds like something that they might have served on the old Adams Family TV show back in the 1960s. So anyway, very easy soup to make. It's just a pureed soup with the sauteed potatoes and onions. You add the half and half at the end. It's quite good. And then another great way to use the uh, stingy nettle, and I think this recipe might be on my webpage, is stingy nettle balls. And this is like the retro spinach ball recipe from the 1950s where you use Pepperidge Farm stuffing mix to hold it all together. And you just substitute the steamed nettle greens for the spinach in that recipe and it works great. All right, so the next plant looks a lot like stinging nettle and sometimes it grows near stinging nettle. It's actually not related to stinging nettle at all. So those of you that have some experience with plants in the audience will recognize that this is a member of the mint family. And the way that you're figuring that out is you see that the leaves grow opposite from each other on the stem and the stems have four equal sides to it. So if we cut that stem and cross section, it would form a square. So yes, this is a member of the mint family and I'm happy to tell you there are no poisonous members of the mint family. There aren't some that taste good, but there are none that uh, would make you sick. So, uh, so that's good. And I'm talking about just the plants. I'm not talking about like, uh, you know, if you distilled oil of peppermint or something like that, and you had lots and lots of that, that could definitely make you sick. No, I'm talking about just consuming the plants themselves. So what is this plant? This is catnip. And catnip does grow wild. It's not a native plant, it's escaped from the gardens, but I do see it in the wild. It has the opposite effect on people as it has on cats. It's a sedative, it's a tranquilizer. So people will drink catnip tea to relax after a stressful day. And you can use the leaves fresh or dried, either way. All right, so this plant curled or curly dock, this is the antidote to the stinging, stinging nettle. You get stung by stinging nettle, you take some young tender dock leaves, scrunch them up, extract the juice out, and just apply that juice where you were stung and it will help make the sting go away. And another medicinal use for this plant, we can't see it in the photo here, but below the ground, there's an enormous yellow taproot. So the herbalists call this plant yellow dock, and, um, and the root has several medicinal uses, but the one I'm most familiar with is it helps the body assimilate iron better. So pregnant women, anemic people will take it for that purpose to boost their iron levels. So this plant's edible too, and the main edible part are the tender young leaves in the center of the plant. You see leaves like this and like this that are just still unrolling, and, uh, and you gather those, and they have a slight bitter tinge to them. So what I will do is just get a pot of water, drop uh, boiling in this, the dock leaves in there and boil them for just 20 seconds and that will take away the bitterness and then you can use those blanched dock leaves in any recipe calling for cooked spinach. So for example, spanakopita, to the Greek spinach pie with the phyllo dough and the feta cheese, the uh, blanched dock leaves work really well in that. So does the, the stinging nettle greens. In fact, there's a recipe, wild green spanakopita is the recipe in my foraging book. All right, so that is curled dock. All right, this species here is one of the most notoriously invasive and hated species on the earth because it is extremely ecologically disruptive. 
it is very tasty though, and it also has medicinal uses. So I'll talk about how yummy it is. So it's a plant called Japanese knotweed. And this is a plant that in the um, late summer begins to bloom and forms these creamy colored flowers. On, and these leaves are attached to stalks that are about seven or eight feet tall, and they typically grow in a uh, patch that might be like 20 or 30 feet in diameter. And it's pretty much to the exclusion of anything else. And so if you see it then, remember where that is, and then go back the following spring, and you will see all these dried reddish brown stalks from the previous year's growth. In the midst of all that, you'll see these shoots coming up. And that is the edible part of a Japanese knotweed. So this in the Portsmouth area, that would be the end of April, beginning of May. It's fun to look for this. So at this stage, when the shoots are about a foot tall and they've got these little red speckles on the stems and a cluster of leaves at the top, that's the wild asparagus stage. And you just cut the plant off at ground level and snap, snap the top leaves off and, uh, and just steam it for a few minutes and eat it hot or cold like asparagus. But my favorite stage to eat this plant is what I call the wild rhubarb stage. And so here we go on this slide. So this is when the shoots are about a foot and a half to two feet tall. And uh, what I'll do is just take my knife out and cut it at uh, ground level. And then what you need to do next is peel off the very outer layer of the knotweed shoot. There's nothing poisonous about it. It's just stringy and get caught in your teeth. But the knotweed stalks are hollow, so you don't want to peel too deeply or all you've left is the hole. You just want to get that very outer layer off. And then you have this green tube that looks like that, that's tart and juicy. And if you, you can eat it on the spot if you want. It tastes kind of like a Granny Smith apple. Or you can chop it up like I've done here in this bowl and then use the chopped, not peeled knotweed stock pieces in just about any recipe calling for rhubarb. So for example, here is my strawberry knotweed pie that I love to make and I love to serve to people. And virtually everybody, I serve this to people preferred over strawberry rhubarb pie. It's that good. All right, but I imagine some of you, the audience are looking at this pie and saying, okay, it's good, but I'm a little intimidated by pie crust and that's a latticework top. I don't know if I can pull that off. So I'm gonna show you a way to use those peeled knotweed pieces that requires no cooking skill whatsoever. Is you can just take those little pieces in a little tart edible container, hollow container, and just fill it with like a salmon mousse or a strawberry flavored cream cheese. And then you have this delicious little uh, yummy appetizer and you do not need to cook to know how to make that. All right, so here's another hated invasive species called garlic mustard. I will admit I don't love eating this one quite as much as the Japanese knotweed. It is at this stage right now in the Boston area, by the way. And this isn't, in my opinion, the best time to eat it. You really want to be harvesting it before it blooms. And the stage I recommend this plant at its yummiest is uh, this part right here. These are the young developing stems before the plant has bloomed. And when these stems are soft and supple, you can eat them and the flavor is relatively mild, pretty tolerable raw, or you could chop it up and use it like in a stir fry. And, uh, and that's the part I recommend you eat. And then, um, uh, and that's uh, garlic mustard. Uh, I, I would wager that just about everybody uh, on this show uh, has this plant in their uh, place where they live. All right, this is another member of the mustard family. This is a plant called wintercress. Right now it's blooming with yellow flowers in the Boston area, but uh, a couple weeks ago it looked like this. And the leaves are edible and the um, uh, florets are edible if you boil them first. Uh, and the boiling like garlic mustard, which uh, I recommend boiling unless you're trying to eat those stems, uh, it's to just to knock down the bitterness uh, to an acceptable level. So if you take these little things that look like little broccoli florets and you boil them for several minutes, the flavor is identical to broccoli rob. And this can be an extremely common farm weed. Uh, and so uh, if you, um, visit a farm and you gather the plant at the right stage, you can get huge amounts of this one. Okay, were this to be a live program, I'd ask everybody in the audience, what is this plant? And almost invariably somebody or many people in the, in the audience will say phlox, and they are wrong. And it's very easy to tell this plant apart from phlox if you know what to look for. 
all phlox family flowers have five petals. These plants have four petals. This is actually Dame's Rocket, another member of the mustard family. And this plant is categorized as an invasive species in Massachusetts and other states. So it's another guilt-free foraging opportunity, as was the garlic mustard and the Japanese knotweed. So, um, so you see how this plant comes in a white flower cluster and in a purpley flower cluster? That is invariably how you see it in the wild, the two colors together. So it's an easy plant to recognize at a distance. And although there are other parts of this plant that are edible, I tend to eat the flowers because uh, flowers are fun to eat. And although the white flowers and the purpley flowers have the same flavor, I tend to just eat the purpley flowers because purple is a funner color than white. And so these have a sweet, garlicky, radishy flavor. So you can eat them just plain, or you can add them as a garnish to other dishes, add them to salads, and, uh, and it's very, very nice. And that will be in season soon in the Boston area. Okay, I took this photo in New Hampshire, and were this to be a live talk, I would ask people, where did I take this photo? And some of you may know. This is the spot in North Conway, New Hampshire, as you're heading north on Route 16, just after you've run the gauntlet of all the outlet stores there in the busy part of North Conway, and you finally emerge and you look across this field and you see these mountains in the background. So that is the presidential range and that is Mount Washington in the background. I took this photo over Memorial Day weekend is to talk to you about dandelions. Dandelions are probably responsible for turning more people off of eating wild plants than anything else. And the story usually goes something like this. It's the spring and the, you look out in your backyard and you see all these dandelions blooming and you say to yourself, I heard dandelions are edible. I should try them. And so you pick a few leaves, you bring them indoors, you put a little oil and vinegar on them, you take a bite. It's incredibly bitter. You spit it out and you say, yuck, I'm never going to eat a wild plant again, which is a real shame because dandelions are great if you eat the right part at the right time. So what is that and when is that? Well, when you start seeing whole fields turning yellow with dandelion flowers, in my opinion, it's really too late to be eating dandelions. So I like to harvest these plants before the flowers bloom. And it's actually the unopened flower buds that I consider the tastiest part of a dandelion plant. In fact, I consider dandelion buds to be among my favorite vegetables, period, cultivated or wild. The flavor is like a cross between corn, spinach, Brussels sprouts, and artichokes. So they're really excellent. So um, now each individual dandelion bud is only about a quarter inch in diameter. So that's small. But if you go to an edge of an organic farm where the dandelion plants often get large, I have found more than 200 dandelion buds per plant. And yes, it takes a little while to pick them off. But if you're finding plants loaded with buds like that, then um, you'll find all you feed yourself, your family, whomever. So, all right, how do you prepare those buds? So what I'll do is just pick the buds off the plant, get a bowl of water out, put the buds in there, stir it around just to get off any dirt, sand, whatever, and then I'll get a pot of water boiling on the stove, throw the dandelion buds in, I will boil them for 60 seconds, and that's it. And then you can incorporate the buds into soups or omelets or casseroles, but before you do anything with them, before you even add any salt or butter to them, try them just plain. I think you'll be amazed at how good they are. Uh, and if you want to eat dandelion leaves, this is the right time to gather them. So if I'm picking these buds off the plants and I see some nice dandelion leaves tucked into the base of the plant, I'll just harvest them too and prepare them the same way. All right, violets are available when the dandelion flowers are blooming. So that's right now in the Boston area and I suspect soon in Portsmouth, if not already. And uh, violet leaves are edible until the flowers go away, then they're not as good. But violet leaves, um, you can eat raw or cooked, and by weight, they're higher in vitamin A than carrots and higher in vitamin C than oranges. And violet flowers are edible. You can uh, uh, just pick them off the plants and eat them right on the spot if you want, or you can add them to salads. Of course, they're very pretty, and then you can candy them and then use the candied violets for decorating other things like this uh, black walnut cake. All right, so here's a close dandelion relative called chicory, and this one's a little out of sequence chronologically. If you haven't figured yet, I've organized my plants chronologically by foraging opportunities. So this photo of the flowers on the left side, it's uh, more from the summer than it would be in the spring. But, uh, but it's in here because there's a close dandelion relative, and it is possible that you could pick chicory thinking it's dandelion or the other way around. And if that happened, there's absolutely no problem at all because these plants are very closely related. They're edible the exact same way. It's so not a problem at all. So chicory flowers are edible. 
They have almost no flavor, but blue is an unusual food color, so it's fun to just snip the petals off to get them into a salad. And then chicory leaves are edible in the early spring or in the late fall. In the uh, warmer summer months, they're way, way too bitter to tolerate. But probably the most well-known edible part on the chicory, actually it's a drinkable part, is the root. And the root is used to make the well-known coffee substitute or additive. So this is all explained in my book. But basically what you want to do is gather the chicory roots and roast them slowly in an oven to the brittle and aromatic. And then throw them in a food processor and grind them up and get some grounds. And then I find I only need about half the amount of chicory grounds to make the same strength beverage as coffee grounds. And um, and so brew your whatever coffee device you use to make coffee, like your Mr. Coffee Maker, your plunger, whatever, you can use the chicory the same way. And the drink is very similar to coffee, especially if you usually drink your coffee with cream and sugar and you drink the chicory the same way. Flavor is very similar. The one big difference is chicory does not have caffeine in it. So if you're one of these people who says, what's the point of drinking it? If there's no caffeine in it, then the chicory is just not going to cut it for you. All right, so the next plant in the show is chickweed. This is out now. This is a very common uh, farm and garden vegetable. And uh, it's available in the spring and in the fall in the cool weather. And um, the entire ground part of the edible is edible, but I tend to just eat the tender parts on the tops of the plants, the leafier bits like this. The stems, if you nibble on a stem, you'll see it tastes like raw corn. And I like to use the chickweed as a sprout substitute in a sandwich or lettuce substitute in a salad. Here are daisies. Daisies are edible, but the tastiest part on a daisy is actually the leaves before the flowers come out. You need to know how to recognize the plant then. This is what it looks like then. And I apologize that this slide is a little bit out of focus. But you notice these tops of these flowers here, this one's in a little better focus. You notice that the flower buds, I'm going to have to talk slower. And what this will, of necessity, result to sync my audio with what you're seeing on the screen is I'm not going to be able to cover all the plants in this show. So what I'm going to do is go through the plants in the summer. And then um, at some point, probably like about uh, 825, we'll see how far I've gotten then. But if I haven't gotten through the show, then I may just... Uh, uh, pull the plug on it. We'll go to the Q&A session, make sure we've got plenty of time for that. And, uh, and then maybe I can come back and finish the show uh, at a webinar that the library gives at some other time. So I'm really sorry about that. Okay. All right. So this is the stage you want to look at if you want to um, eat daisy leaves. Uh, before the flowers come out is when the leaves are going to be the tastiest. And uh, and I find daisy leaves can be so tasty is I've never bothered to cook them. I just eat them raw and I love to add them to salads. All right, can you let me know when you see the next image, lamb, Lamb's Quarters, and we'll just do it that way. Yes, yeah, so there's Lamb's Quarters, and you notice the white dust in the center of each plant that's not from the roadside or anything. That's a natural mealy dust the plant produces on its own and it's a good way to help identify this plant. So this is a really common um, uh, farm and garden weed, and this slide was taken in the Boston area the first week of June, so that's a good time to look for it in New England. But you can find it at this stage later times during the year because uh, this is a very opportunistic weed, so anytime the ground is disturbed, the seeds can germinate. And so I found it at this stage as late as November. Seeing the next slide, sheep sorrel. Yep. All right, we're in business now. Okay, so this plant is a close relative of the French garden sorrel. You can use it the same way as you can make a sorrel sauce from it, a sorrel soup from it, and so on. And, um, and you can eat it raw, you can eat it cooked. Here's a completely unrelated plant with the same flavor called wood sorrel or sour grass. And this one has heart-shaped leaflets. See that right there? And um, and this one, uh, any tender part of the plant you can eat, so these leaves you can eat, the flowers you can eat, these little guys right here are the seed capsules, and those are tart and juicy too. You can eat them too. 
Now the chemical responsible for the sour flavor in this plant is in, or in the sheep sorrel in the previous slide is a chemical called oxalic acid, which could be harmful to eat in huge amounts. Like if you ate a big sample full of just either or both of these plants, it could inhibit your body's ability to uptake calcium or could irritate your stomach lining, but there's no reason to be unduly concerned about these chemicals because they're present in a lot of conventional vegetables like beets and spinach and rhubarb. And so as long as you're eating them in moderation with other things, it's perfectly fine. All right, next one. So let's go next. All right, so here's a plant called wild lettuce. And... Um, there are several different kinds of wild lettuce, and this lettuce right here, this is like Tuca canadensis, which happens to be uh, the tastier wild lettuce. All wild lettuces are edible. Some are bitter from the get-go, and the ones that are bitter from the get-go, these leaves right here, the terminal lobe on a bitter wild lettuce, this is going to be broad. You see how this one is skinny like a finger? So this is like Tuca canadensis, and this one is mild. Even after it begins to bolt like this, it's still mild. The stem and the leaves are mild. And that's my mom over here on the right. So this is a plant I'm propagating my nursery and she's helping me transplant some of these wild lettuce plants uh, that I grew from seed. It's a fun plant to grow from seed. You can gather the seeds in uh, September. All right, so when I make things from wild ingredients, I'm not a purist about it. I don't insist that every single ingredient be wild. So for example, when I make that strawberry knotweed pie, I don't have to use yak butter for the shortening. I can use regular butter, regular sugar, and the knotweed makes it a wild dish. But it is fun to make a salad completely from wild ingredients, uh, which is what I've done in the photo here. Although I want to say that there's, um, um, if all you did was just throw a few violet flowers in a salad, that's perfectly fine. That's making a wild salad. You don't have to go extreme like I did here. So let me tell you what's in the photo. So you got some chicory flowers here, some mustard flowers in the photo, and then the green stuff, there's chickweed and lamb's quarters and wood sorrel and sheep sorrel and things like that bulking up the salad. And then these little red berries are partridge berries, and then the little uh, yellowish orange berries are ground cherries. So here is partridge berries and uh, a pretty common ground cover here in New England. And the red berries are the edible part. These berries have virtually no flavor. So why eat them? Because they're pretty. So I'll put a few of these on top of a salad just to get that nice color in there. And then here are ground cherries. So this is a wild cousin of a tomato. And this one's also a little bit out of sequence chronologically because these fruit won't be available till toward the end of the summer. And then the flower looks like that, the husk, which is called a calyx botanically. The fruit develops inside here. And when this is ripe, this calyx turns a tan color and it falls off the plant with a fruit inside. And that's why it's called ground cherry because when you look for the fruits, you wanna actually look underneath the plant to where the fruits have fallen off the plant and they're still on the ground. Now, the key thing to remember with this fruit to distinguish it from any poisonous lookalikes is you cannot see this fruit unless you take the husk off. So if you're looking at something where you can see it without taking any husks off and you're just looking at something and it looks like a yellow tomato, it's probably a poisonous lookalike called, called horse nettle uh, that you would not want to eat. So make sure anything you think is a ground cherry has this calyx covering. Uh, that you have to peel before you see it. And then it tastes like a sweet cherry tomato. They're quite good. All right, here's a plant called evening primrose. This is what it looks like between its first and second growing season. That's the right stage where you yank up the root to get it. And there's the root. And you see it's got pink coloration near the top. And so far, my favorite way to use evening primrose is to make pancakes with the roots, like potato pancakes. So you can use whatever recipe for potato pancakes that you have, and you can substitute equivalent amount of the grated evening primrose root uh, in that recipe, it should work great. So here is burdock. This is the plant where the round burrs get caught in your socks and your dog's fall, uh, fur in the fall. And the guy who invented Velcro did get the idea from these burrs, by the way. So uh, this uh, is a wonderfully edible plant, not this part, but most of the rest of the plant. So here's what the plant looks like uh, around now, this time of year, uh, when uh, the leaves are coming out from the root that has wintered over. So this is a biennial, which means it's a plant with a two-year life cycle. The first year, it looks like this. 
and it only does this, and it's sending energy down to this big page taproot. And then the second year, it grows a flower stalk, and I'll talk about that in a second. So the root is one of the edible stages of this plant. You want to harvest it between the first and second growing seasons. That's when the max amount of food energy is in there. And um, unfortunately, though, you can't just grab the foliage and yank on it and get a burdock root out that way. You have to dig up the roots. And it's a lot of work, and I don't usually bother. And I pretty much guarantee that your patients will give out before the root does, because they're very, very long. And so you'd be digging and digging and digging. At some point, you say, ah, oh, the heck with it. You might slice off like nine inches worth of root. And it kept going. And uh, one easy way to eat that root, and you don't need to peel it, is just wash it off and then slice it crosswise in half inch thick rounds and boil it in salted water till it's tender. And it will taste like a starchy artichoke. But I'm too lazy to do that. Instead, I harvest the plant in the second year's worth of growth. And I've just cut off the outer leaves to show you this in the center, this cylindrical flower stalk emerging from the uh, base of the plant. So this is the part that I like to harvest, and I cut it off at ground level and lop off the top cluster leaves, and that's the part I'm harvesting. So all these on the left, this took me less than half an hour to harvest all these burdock flower stalks. Now you do have to peel the very outer layer off these stalks because it's bitter and stringy, so peel that off. But unlike the knotweed, the burdock stalks are solid all the way through, so you have a lot of food left over after you uh, peel them. And then you slice those crosswise and boil them in salted water till it's tender, which is only about five minutes, and then that's what you get. And you could eat them just plain. It's a very nice vegetable, just plain, or it's really good thrown in spaghetti sauce, or it's really good in the recipe where ordinarily when you make it, you use artichoke hearts and Parmesan cheese and, and mayonnaise and breadcrumbs and you mix it all together and you bake it in the oven and it's the spread that you put on crackers. Well, you can substitute the boiled burdock flour stock rounds for the artichoke hearts, that recipe, it works great. So there it is. And, uh, and this recipe is on my webpage. So uh, uh, this would be a good thing to try. Okay, here is a plant called catbriar, Smilax rotundifolia. And, and here in Southern New England, it's quite common and it's a plant that's a real pain to bushwhack through because the mature plant, the foliage is woody and thorny and it often grows in real dense tangles. Uh, but in the spring, it produces these tender growing tips. And this whole thing is very soft and flexible and you can just break it off. Even the thorns, you can push them with your fingers and you just pop the whole thing in your mouth. It's uh, nice and tart. Now, another cousin of this plant that I like better and that I have seen grow in the Portsmouth area is a plant called carrion flower. This is Smilax herbacea. And uh, so there's the dried stalks from last year's carrion flower. That's where the berries were right there. And that's the edible part right there, these growing stalks. And these will come out toward the end of May. And they look a lot like asparagus. You harvest them like asparagus. You uh, cook them like asparagus. They taste like asparagus. They're related to asparagus. So all that's great. So why is the plant called carrion flower? Well, here we are camping and you see I'm using a Frisbee as a plate here. And you see these little guys right here, they are the flower buds. And if we had waited a week later to harvest the plant, this is what a mature carrion flower bloom looks like. And that's when you discover why it's called carrion flower because those flowers smell like rotting meat or dirty gym socks. So if you encounter the plant when it's blooming, it's a rather unpleasant experience. But if you harvest it in the shoot stage before the plant blooms, it's quite good. All right, here is black locust. This is a native species to Virginia and to the southeast part of the U.S. It's not native to New England. It's actually considered an invasive species in several New England states. Uh, so that would make it a complete guilt-free foraging opportunity. And don't worry about the bumblebee, the pollinator, because these are trees that get to be 40 or 50 feet tall. And when the flowers are blooming, they're blooming from top to bottom with thousands and thousands of blossoms. So it's okay. You can pick the flowers from the lower branches and let the bumblebees fly up into the upper branches to get their share. And there's usually tons of flowers and everybody gets all they need. So these flowers are available around Memorial Day and they're delicious raw or cooked and the flavor they smell like jasmine and the and they taste like sweet pea pods so they're quite good and uh you can strip them off their central racemes oops sorry and they will um look like that and so you could eat them raw you could eat them cooked and one fun way to cook them is to make fritters from them and the recipe 
for this, these black locust fritters is in my book. And it's a great thing to serve to company once we can have company over again for a Sunday brunch. And I think they'll be very uh, favorably impressed with how yummy these fritters are. Okay, so here's a plant called pokeweed that is completely poisonous except for one edible stage. And the edible stage looks like this when the shoots are about six to 10 inches tall. And even if this stage, you have to boil these shoots for seven minutes to make them safe to eat. And then uh, they won't shrink or get mushy on you even after all that boiling. And um, they're um, quite tasty, sort of like asparagus, but its own unique flavor. So you might be saying to yourself, well, I don't see any real distinguishing characteristics about that pokeweed shoot. Uh, there's probably other things that look like that. And the answer is yes, there are other things that look like that. So how do you know it's pokeweed? Here's the big favor the plant does for you. So this is the plant, once again, that you know, it produces these berries in the late summer. The berries aren't edible. Uh, and the plants get about five feet tall. And when it dies at the end of the growing season, it does not disappear. That dried stem, from last year's plant will persist as a skeleton and still be there the following spring. And we'll st almost always will still be there when the shoots for the current year's growth are coming up. So when you see something that looks like that, look for the shoots of last year's pokeweed stalk going into the ground at the same place and then you'll know for sure it's pokeweed. All right, here's milkweed and it's only the common milkweed in this region that's the edible one. So butterfly weed's not edible, uh, swamp milkweed's not edible. So this is a native species, but it is quite common. And I call it a procrastinating forager's dream food in my book because it's got at least four edible stages to it. And they happen chronologically in succession. So if you mess up and miss a stage, you just wait a while till the next edible stage develops. This happens to be edible stage number three, these milkweed flower buds when they're in a tight green cluster like this. Use the same exact cooking method for milkweed that you use for pokeweed is you uh, boil it for seven minutes and uh, so in this slide right here, you can see these milkweed buds have already been boiled for seven minutes and look how well they held up. Uh, if anything, they look even better than they did on the plant. So at this stage, you could just eat these as a side dish, just like this, or you can add them to other things. And here's a good way to use them. This recipe from my book called Milkweed Egg Puff, which is like a cross between a souffle and a casserole. And, um, and you can use other things in that recipe too. Then the last part of the plant, that is available for eating are the pods. And when the pods are up to an inch and a half long and nice and firm to the touch, not springy or spongy, you can eat them after boiling for seven minutes and the texture and the flavor is very similar to green beans. All right, well, there is the monarch butterfly caterpillar to remind us that this plant has an important ecological purpose and that is it is the host plant for these monarch butterfly caterpillars. So it is really important to uh, make sure that we're not depleting the natural environment of milkweed plants so that there's a lot around uh, so the monarch butterflies can find plenty uh, that they need. So this is a plant I'm actively propagating in my nursery. I've got it growing next to my driveway in front of my house and the monarchs have found it there and uh, milkweed, uh, the uh, butterflies are forming uh, um, chrysalises uh, nearby the patch of milkweed and flying off uh, when they turn into mature adults. So anyway, if all you do in the fall when you're traveling around, you see some milkweed uh, mature pods with a, a seam split open and all that parachute business attached to the seed showing, you just gather a couple of those pods and as you're traveling around, you see nice habitat for some milkweed that doesn't have any like the edge of a school ball field or a bike path, something like that. Just release those parachutes and help start a new colony. And that would be a great way to uh, thank the milkweed for uh, eating it earlier in the season. All right, here's sassafras. And sassafras is an exceedingly easy plant to recognize. It has leaves with three different shapes all on the same tree. So there's leaves with no thumbs, one thumb, and two thumbs all on the same plant. It's the only plant that does that. And uh, sassafras has two main edible flavors. So the first one is in the root bark. And uh, that flavor has that very familiar root beer flavor. So you can make sassafras tea by steeping the roots or the root bark in hot water for a few minutes. Uh, in my book, I've got a recipe for sassafras uh, candy, which is like the root beer barrels used to buy at the penny candy store, only even better because there's little bits of root bark embedded in the candy. All right, now I have to tell you about one possible thing that might make you not want to eat this plant, and that is that um, there's a chemical, an essential oil called saffron that is in the sassafras root bark. And about 60 years ago, several studies were done 
where they fed some rats a huge amount of saffron, and some of those rats got cancer, and the Food and Drug Administration found out about this, and they said, okay, we're going to ban uh, saffron containing sassafras um, uh, foods, drinks from the food supply, and that ban is still in effect. And so just knowing that might make you want to say, okay, just in case there's anything to this, uh, I'm not going to consume this plant, and I would totally support you in that. I'll just let you know that uh, all those studies proved is that the roots in very large amounts might be carcinogenic, the saffron might be carcinogenic to rats, but uh, uh, I don't know of any studies, and I know other foragers like me that have looked into this quite a bit, and we haven't found even anecdotal evidence of humans getting cancer from sassafras roots. But even so, if you say, I, I just don't want to take the chance, I totally support you in that. In fact, I totally support you wherever your comfort level is on anything I'm talking about today. If, you, if you're not sure you've identified the right plant, or you're not sure that the spot where it's growing is a clean area and there's no contamination in the soil, or anything that would just make you hesitate, uh, I encourage you uh, to uh, use your common sense and, and trust your judgment. And if you're uncomfortable about eating something, uh, then just don't eat it. There is an edible part on sassafras though, where saffron is not an issue, and that is the young sassafras leaves. They're just about at this stage in the binary right now. And these leaves are what filet powder is made from. So if you ever heard of filet powder like filet gumbo, it is made from dried powdered sassafras leaves. And you can gather your own. Of course, you're going to be a good conservationist and not strip a plant like this of every single leaf. No, you pick a few off this plant and a few off the next plant and then bring them home and just spread them out in a cookie sheet and dry them. Uh, you don't need to use a food dehydrator or anything. And then just... Uh, uh, crumble up the leaves and then put them in a salt and pepper type shaker and then add it to your food at the end to flavor and thicken it. And, uh, and that's uh, a nice thing to do. All right, so here is cattails, this whole chapter in my book on cattails. Some of you might have heard of a guy named Yule Gibbons who wrote a famous book uh, for foragers called Stalking the Wild Asparagus. And he's got a chapter on cattails and he calls cattails the supermarket of the swamps in that uh, chapter because there's so many edible parts to cattails. I'll just cover a few uh, in this show. So in this photo, I'm showing you where the arrow is, the immature bloom spike. So there's a cattail flower hiding underneath there. You can't see it because of the leaves that are holding it, but it's actually the immature stage when you want to harvest it. And then it looks like this. These are the male flowers on top, the female flowers in the bottom. And you uh, boil these until they're tender and then the texture is like a cross between corn and artichokes. And then another yummy part on a cattail is the cattail heart. And this is a tender part of the stem, which is still available if you're harvesting the immature flowers. You should be able further down in the stem to find the nice tender cattail heart. And the flavor is kind of similar to cucumber or hearts of palm. It's quite good. And then cattail pollen, which is hypoallergenic, is edible. And you can just go into the marsh with the plastic bag when the male flowers are blooming and just bend the ripe flower into the bag and give it a little shake and this cloudy yellow pollen comes off. And keep doing that. And after a while, you'll have a cup of more of the pollen. And just put it through any kind of a filter just to separate any twigs or bugs or anything that got in there. And then add that cattail pollen to regular flour to make these delicious and nutritious and uh, very pretty cattail pollen uh, baked products like these muffins. All right, wild rice. Uh, this uh, is a plant that grows here in New England. So the Merrimack River that I mentioned before that has the ostrich fern fiddleheads, there are patches of wild rice that grow in the Merrimack River, the part that's not that far away from Portsmouth. I'll be honest with you though, I have never harvested my own wild rice. Uh, it's a lot of work. You have to gather the seed. Well, big deal. I gather stuff all, all the time. That's not a big deal. But then you have to parch it. You have to winnow it. And I just haven't done that myself. I buy my wild rice from the Ojibwe Indian tribe that's collecting them in the traditional way uh, in the canoes and the lakes in northern Minnesota. And they're processing uh, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of wild rice at a time. So at that scale, uh, what you know, the parching and winnowing makes a lot of sense. Uh, having said all that, I do know people in England that have gathered and processed their own wild rice, so you can uh, do it here. All right, here is a plant called calamus or sweet flag, and the edible part on this plant uh, 
is actually the tender hearts down here. The rhizomes are edible too, but they're really, really spicy. A milder part is down in here where you peel these outer leaves off and then the inner leaves are yellowish and they have kind of a gingery flavor. So a little goes a long way and you can just chop it up and put it into a salad for gingery flavor. So here's a plant called basswood. The, uh, there's also a non-native cousin called the uh, Tilia cordata. And either way, they're edible. And it's the young leaves when they first come out. So that will be soon here in New England. And then the flowers are edible and the flowers you make a tea from. And so this is around the end of June. You want to look for these flowers. And uh, they have a nice lemon honey smell. And the flavor of the tea is similar to that. And the tea that you make from the flowers uh, has a very nice flavor and it has at least two medicinal uses. It's soothing to your digestive system and your mental state at the same time. So herbalists really like this one. And it's worth drinking just for the flavor alone, but it also has uh, medicinal benefits too. All right, here's a plant called uh, Juneberry or um, Shadbush. And uh, it might still be blooming like this in the Portsmouth area. It's certainly in central northern New Hampshire, it would be blooming like this. And that's a great time to spot the plants because when the fruit is ripe, it's purple and purple is a hard color to see at a distance. So that's what you want to look for when the fruit is ripe. So it's called Juneberry in most of its range because the fruit is ripe in June. In New Hampshire, I might be tempted to call it July berry because it ripens a little bit later. And so there's a close up of the fruit and um, and they look a lot like blueberries, but they actually don't taste like blueberries at all. They taste like a cross between cherries and almonds. Uh, and they're all related members of the rose family. So these are great fruits for stuffing your face right by the tree or for uh, drying and then adding to granola, or you can make muffins from them. And uh, this is a plant I've also propagated from seed. So let me just say that... Um, uh, although some of the plants I talked about in the show, like fiddleheads and marsh marigolds, you're typically going to go out into natural habitats to look for those. For the Juneberry plants, the, the Amelanchier species, the shadbush, those are frequently planted in parks. And so you could be an urban forager and still encounter this one. It's quite common in parks. When I used to work in downtown Boston, I used to work to a local park in my lunch hour and pick uh, quarts of these fruits when they were ripe. And... Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so you can gather it that way. And so this is one of the plants I propagated from seed. It's quite easy. So you just eat those seeds when you find them. And then the way you gather this seed is you spit them into your hand and then you store them in plastic bags in your fridge. That's called stratification. And then the seeds will tell when they're ready to be sown is they'll start to sprout in your fridge and then you sow them and then uh, here they are growing in my nursery. They're, these plants are now actually a foot and a half tall in my nursery, and I've got several dozen that I grew just from the fruit I picked in a park and saved the seeds and grew these plants. All right, so mulberries are ripe at the same time as juneberries, and they often go near each other, and I'll often mix juneberries and mulberries together like to make this strudel. All right, wild strawberries are edible too, and I'm going to have you just read this slide. I'm going to take a quick bio break and be right back. While Russ is gone, I'll just say everybody that if you have questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat because I'm keeping track of some of the ones um, that people have asked so far. And if he doesn't answer them, we can ask him at the end. Okay, thanks for your patience. So the slide pretty much says everything I need to say about strawberries, except another edible part that I don't mention on the slide here. And that is that uh, you can make tea from strawberry leaves when the leaves are fresh or thoroughly dried. Apparently when they're wilted, they're slightly toxic, but fresh or thoroughly dried is fine. And the tea you make from the leaves does taste at least vaguely like the fruit and it does have vitamin C in it. So if you felt a case of scurvy coming on, you could rush out and make yourself some uh, strawberry leaf tea. 
I, here's jewelweed, and many of you will know this plant is an antidote to poison ivy. And what you do is just grab the whole plant. It's nice and juicy and succulent. It's, it's still small at this time of year, but in summer, when it gets to be about two feet tall, that's a good time to grab it and just uh, uh, extract the juice out of it just by rubbing it and then apply that juice where you either have poison ivy or where you think you're exposed to poison ivy. But there is an edible part to jewelweed and it is the ripe seeds that are included, enclosed in these seed capsules. The tricky part about harvesting those seeds is when the seed capsule is ripe, it will explode at the slightest touch. And so uh, if you're not uh, skillful, uh, the seeds will just fly around all over the place and you won't gather any. So this is what I recommend that you do, is when you see a seed pod like that, is you sneak up on it and you grab it and you have it explode in your hand. Don't worry, it won't hurt. And then, so there's a ripe seed pod. That's what you want to look for. So grab that and have it explode in your hand. Then it does all this business. And letter D are the ripe seeds. That's what they look like. And they taste like walnuts, like store-bought English walnuts. And, um, and that's very good. The, the seeds are teeny, so you're not going to like feed a huge dinner party. Even if you could have a dinner party, you're not going to feed them with huge mounds of jewelweed seeds. <laughs> it would be too hard to collect so many. But anyway, uh, a few just nibbling on the trail or adding to a salad, that'd be fine. Another cool thing you could do with these seeds, and you don't need to do this to eat them, but if you uh, gently rub the outer seed covering off these seeds, the inner seed color is this beautiful, bright, bright robin's egg blue color. And I have no idea why that color is in there, because no creatures ever see it. It's just one of those unexplained mysteries of Mother Nature. All right, I hope everybody watching this show has seen this plant. This is a really common garden weed and farm weed the world over. It's called purslane, and this is a uh, hot weather weed, so you're not going to see it this time of year. It won't germinate until the weather really warms up, and um, just about everything you're seeing in that photo is edible, so the leaves are edible, the stems are edible. Some people will pickle the uh, larger stems. Uh, the plant's edible rods, edible cooked, it's high in iron, it's high in omega-3 fatty acids. And um, I'm going to show you a way to use the purslane that, once again, requires no cooking skill on your part at all, and that is to add the purslane leaves to gazpacho. And of course, you could make the gazpacho if you wanted to, but you don't have to make the gazpacho. You could go to a store um, that makes this kind of gazpacho and just buy it and then just throw the purslane leaves in there and the texture of the purslane works really well in a gazpacho. All right, so black raspberry is an early summer edible plant. Uh, I don't need to tell you what to do with black raspberry fruit. I will point out though that this color, which you uh, particularly notice in the winter time, like uh, when the snow is out, um, that a distinctive purple coloration on the black raspberry stems is a giveaway as to what they are. You can often spot them at a distance. And so if I'm out cross-country skiing in February and I see stems like that, I remember where those are so I can go back in late June, early July, look for the fruit. All right, black cherries are edible. They vary in flavor from tree to tree. Sometimes they're puckery and astringent, other times they're um, uh, quite nicely flavored. Um, and uh, the only downside to this fruit is that they're small. So black cherry fruits will approach but not quite get to a half an inch in diameter. And the pits inside each fruit aren't that much smaller than conventional cherry pits. So I wouldn't recommend trying to use black cherries for any recipe that requires pitting each individual fruit because that would be exceedingly tiresome. So what I'll do if I don't just stuff my face with the black cherries right by the tree is I'll pick them and uh, strip them off these central stalks and then throw them in a pot with some water and simmer it for a while to uh, sum up. And then I will uh, put everything through a food mill or a sieve and then the uh, pulp and the juice goes through and the seeds are held, the pits are held back. And then that, what goes through the sieve is what you use as raw material for making uh, black cherry jam, jelly, um, uh, black cherry cordials, uh, stuff like that. All right. Black huckleberries. Uh, this is a very common plant in New England, and I'm sure a lot of people pick these thinking they're blueberries. They're related to blueberries, so there's no harm in it. So they are uh, uh, a little waterier and seedier than regular blueberries, but other than that, they're fine. And um, 
they tend to like a little bit drier habitat than regular blueberries, but that's a good one to look for. So bayberries are edible. The main part that's edible are the leaves, and you can use them uh, like bay leaves in cooking. And this plant, although it's often associated with a coastline, like where Portsmouth is, you can also see it in the interior where it can grow in gravel pits because it, it can make its own nitrogen fertilizer. Same thing with this relative plant. This is sweet fern. It's not a fern at all. It just looks like a fern. And this is one of our native species the American colonists made tea with when they were boycotting the British tea during the Revolutionary War era, is they would just steep the leaves in hot water for a few minutes and, uh, and get the flavor. And there are little nutlets on these that you can eat too. Here is a native mint species called wild bergamot, which um, the leaves uh, have a very similar flavor to oregano. And so I would use this one instead, uh, you know, if you wanted to um, uh, propagate an edible native species, this would be a good choice because the flowers are popular with pollinators, but you can eat it too because the leaves taste like oregano. So you could use them for like uh, pizza topping, soups, uh, omelets, stuff like that. Here's another uh, tea plant. This is sweet goldenrod. This is one I propagate in my nursery, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So another plant the colonists made tea from during the Revolutionary War era. The leaves uh, and flowers smell and taste like licorice, so it's really fun. Uh, a, a licorice flavor goldenrod, and it's a native species to southern New England. So not in the Portsmouth, New Hampshire area. You could grow it there, but you won't find it in the wild in Portsmouth. You have to go further south into uh, Massachusetts. All right, and as I said, it's easy to grow. So uh, in this slide shows that this seed, after this flower bloomed, the seed fell into the pot and then little baby sweet goldenrods grew in that same pot in the same growing season. And when you see that, you know this is a plant that's easy to grow from seed. All right, spice bush. So this one's more common in Southern New England than Northern New England, but you can run into it in the Portsmouth area. And this is another plant the American colonists made tea from. They would just steep the twigs in hot water for a few minutes. And I will um, uh, uh, gather these berries and dry them and use them as avery spice. So like uh, uh, alternative to black pepper, Szechuan peppercorns. Um, but I must add that these berries are high in lipids, which is a vegetable fat, so they're high in calories. And so the songbirds, our migrating songbirds, know that. And so they seek out these berries to eat them to fuel their southward migrations. So it is really important if you're gathering spice bush berries from the wild that you leave plenty of berries on the plants so the songbirds get all they need. And another fun thing that you might encounter if you are uh, finding uh, spice bush plants in the wild or if you grow one in your yard is spice bush is the host plant for this really cool critter called the spice bush swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. So after the eggs hatch, this little half inch long caterpillar is trying to imitate bird poop. So that's a pretty effective disguise. And then it morphs into this form. And these are fake eyes up here. The real eyes are down here. The caterpillar is trying to impersonate a snake to scare birds away from eating it. And even at the pupa stage, look how much this pupa looks like a dried leaf. So isn't it cool that this creature has evolved all these amazing disguises to avoid being eaten? All right, here is wintergreen, really common plant throughout New England. And often you see it in association with pine trees. So you hear the white pine needles here. So uh, berries are edible. You often find them year round. They will persist. Uh, through the winter into the following year. And then these tender reddish green leaves, the right leaves are making tea. And then um, the, uh, uh, you don't have to brew them in hot water. Uh, you could just make a sun tea from them. And, but I wanna show you a plant, and I think this might be the last plant we get to in this show before we go to the Q&A. Uh, and I will have to do the rest of the slides in some other show uh, later on, I hope. Anyway. Here's the last one. This is black or yellow birch, both common in the Portsmouth area and, uh, and further south and north, black birch further south, yellow birch further north. They are, uh, I did uh, provide a handout to the library on this species called Tasty uh, Teas from Trees that gives you more details about what I'm just about to say. So uh, if you can access that handout, uh, everything I'm about to say is written down in that handout. So, uh, 
the oil of wintergreen, the same oil that's in the wintergreen plant is in the inner bark of the black or yellow birch. And so any time of year you find this plant, you can make a wintergreen flavored tea. So you just gather up a bunch of the twigs and you peel them with a knife or a carrot peeler and then throw the peelings and the peeled twigs in a jar full of water and let it sit around for an hour. And that's it, that's all you have to do. And, um, and you can tap any species of birch, including the paper birch for sap, as long as the trees are big enough. And the, the trees really gush um, uh, the sap when you tap them. Uh, so you can get a gallon of sap in an hour, but unfortunately it's watery than even maple sap and you have to boil the heck out of it to get anything. And what you eventually get uh, looks and tastes like molasses, but um, it's a lot of work. And I would say if you want molasses, just go to the store and buy molasses. You're not going to save any time or money making your own uh, molasses from birch sap. Having said that, if let's say you are camping during the time of the year when the birch sap is flowing, which in uh, southern New Hampshire would be first couple weeks of April, and you were concerned about the potability of the water supplies at the place where you were camping, is you could tap the birch trees and get all the pure, clean drinking water you need that way. And let me add one last thing about the wintergreen and the black birch, okay? So the chemical responsible for the wintergreen flavor in these plants is a chemical called methyl salicylate. And it is related to salicylic acid, which is the active ingredient in aspirin. So it does have a pain killing effect. So if you were hiking in the woods and you twisted your ankle, you could find a black or yellow birch twig to chew on. And at the very least, it would distract you from the pain in your ankle. All right. So with that, let's move on to this last slide, which has to do with my book. And so I'm very sorry that uh, I had to skip a whole bunch of things, but in order to keep to schedule, hopefully we'll get to those slides later. So in just a minute, I'll turn off my screen and we'll go to the chat, or, or actually uh, we'll leave this up and we can go to the chat in just a second. But I just want to explain about this book. So I kept referring to it during the talk and a lot of the recipes and chapters that I mentioned are in this book. And it's a little bit hard to get right now because the main person that provides it is Essex County Greenbelt, which is in the northeastern corner of Massachusetts. So it's the closest part of Massachusetts to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So that's good for those of you that are local because you can buy this book and drive to their office and they will leave it outside the office for you to pick it up. If you live further away and you need to have the book mailed to you, there is a used bookstore called B Street Books that uh, may have them in stock. I say may because after every talk I give, they get lots of requests for books and um, until they get replenished, they can run out temporarily. So uh, I hope you're patient. Uh, we're actually pretty close to being done selling through the seventh printing of this book. And uh, we hope to get it reprinted in the next month or two. And if that happens, uh, there will be good supplies available for everybody. And I realize it doesn't help you where you want immediate gratification to get a book right away. Uh, so I apologize in advance if it's a little tough to get. Um, a lot of libraries have this book, so you could see if you can just take it out of the library and rent it that way. And that's a good plug for libraries in general. All right, so I'm going to be done, and let's turn this over to the Q&A part of the talk. Okay, Russ, I'm going to have you keep your screen up just in case any sure. of the questions that you're answering you have a, a visual for. Great. Um, I have a question. Someone asked, how much is the book? Oh, $15. And I should say that none of that money goes to me. It all goes to Greenbelt in gratitude for the fact that they allow foraging as a permitted activity in all their properties that are open to the public. And I'm so grateful for that. I said, just keep all the money the book makes and just buy more land with it. So if you go to ecga.org, that's their website. Uh, and you can just access their property maps and see where they are. And then you can just go and, uh, and forage. Uh, of course, if you do, I hope that you're a good conservation-minded forager like I talked about at the beginning of the show. But you are allowed to pick stuff there. Okay, we had a question at the very beginning of the talk about a plant in the area that is poisonous here, but looks identical to a plant that's edible in China. And they're wondering if you know what that might be. Ha! <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I've never been to China, so uh, I don't know. Sorry about that. Um, 
we had somebody talking about oxalic acid and um, yes. the fact that too much can in fact be toxic for people. Can you talk about that at all? Yes. So once again, um, you know, if you're somebody who is unusually susceptible to something like that, you would have to be aware of eating spinach or beets or rhubarb or lots of conventional vegetables that have oxalic acid in them. So it's not some weird thing that's just in wild plants that you only have to worry about it there. It's in conventional vegetables too. But for most people, as long as the thing that's got oxalic acid in it has eaten as a component of a lot of other stuff, so, uh, you know, it's like, you know, there's a few sheep sorrel leaves in a diversified salad that's got lettuce in it and tomatoes and other things. That isn't enough to bother uh, a normal person's stomach. You really have to be unusually highly susceptible or just eat a concentrated amount of a wild or conventional food that's high in oxalic acid to run into a problem. All right, we had another question about uh, fiddle fiddleheads if you've had the ones from yes. cinnamon ferns. Yes, so um, they are, I, I know people have eaten those and I guess they're not so horrible that, uh, you know, you uh, feel ill after eating them or you spit them out. But uh, the main bad thing about cinnamon ferns is the wool that grows on the outside of the fiddleheads. It takes forever to pick off that wool. And it's not very appetizing to try and eat those fiddleheads with the wool still attached. So I, I don't consider cinnamon ferns edible, cinnamon fern fiddleheads edible. Okay, Russ, are there any plants that are not safe for pregnant women to forage and eat? Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, there could be, and uh, I have to profess that I'm not that uh, up on it. So um, uh, there's, there's nothing I can think of that I covered in my talk that I know for sure falls into that category. So, uh, uh, you know, as I say, uh, you know, probably the thing to do is to learn the plants, the conventional plants that might be unsafe for pregnant women to eat. And then, um, you know, you want to steer away from the wild relatives of those plants that I, I would feel would be warranted. Other than that, I, I, I don't think it's generally anything to worry about. Any more there's questions? Plenty of, there's plenty of questions. Robin and I are trying to switch, so I'm waiting for her. Oh, okay, sure. She's sorry, yeah. I have some connection issues. Um, let's see. Are raspberry leaves okay for tea fresh, or do they have to be dried to remove toxicity? Oh, oh great. So thank you for bringing that up. So, so raspberries. So raspberries in the rubus genus. So the rubus genus that I covered in my show before, where I talked about black raspberry. Let's go back to that. So black raspberry, here we go. So yeah, so this is in the rubus genus and, and you can make tea from any leaf of a rubus genus plant. So in this case, it's black raspberry, but red raspberry, blackberry. Uh, but the same rule applies for these that applies for the strawberry leaves. So you wanna make the tea from fresh or thoroughly dried leaves. Apparently when the leaves are wilted, they're slightly toxic, but fresh or thoroughly dried is fine. And uh, there are two interesting medicinal uses attributed to rubus family plants. So red raspberry leaf tea is supposed to be good for pregnant women. There we go, because it helps tone the uterine walls. So uh, that's one factor. And then uh, blackberry leaf tea is supposed to be good for constipation and for diarrhea, which I think is a pretty neat trick that it's effective at both ends of the spectrum there. Great. I have a question from somebody who says, do you have advice on avoiding certain areas for harvesting things like dandelions, mustard greens, um, because of oh, yes. pesticides? Mm -hmm. All right, yes. Yeah. So I avoid... Um, really manicured areas like closely cropped lawns, golf courses, places where, you know, it looks like people are going out with tweezers to get any little, you know, leaf or twig that's out of place. 
places like that, it's pretty likely that people are using herbicides or pesticides or enough to control the things they don't like. So I avoid places like that. I avoid gathering along heavily traveled roadways, places where everybody takes their dog for a walk. Although if something is growing above a certain height, even a Great Dane can't reach it. So I don't worry that much about it. And uh, there's no magic formula about this. Just use your common sense. So for example, if you're hiking in the woods and you see a nice berry patch and you see a bunch of building debris dump right next to the berry patch, probably not a good idea to um, uh, pick from that berry patch. If the plants themselves don't look healthy, they're stunted or wilted or spotted, or there's just something off about them, it's possible that they're picking up some contaminants in the soil that you don't want to expose yourself to. Or especially for some of these invasive species like the garlic mustard or the Japanese knotweed, sometimes they're targeted with herbicides and then you wouldn't want to eat them. So how do you know if a plant has been hit with an herbicide? Well, my experience is that unless you're there less than 15 minutes after those plants were sprayed, you can tell because the plants start to look horrible almost right away. And so uh, I don't, uh, so I, We'll try to find the patches that are of plants that are away from places where I think herbicide use was used. Sometimes it's impossible to know, but I try to avoid it if I can. And I um, uh, can't remember what else I was gonna say about that. I hope that answered the question. That's great, thank you. Okay, um, sassafras and wintergreen, are there kidney issues when you ingest more than a certain amount? Oh, so I talked about sassafras and this saffron that the Food and Drug Administration thinks might be carcinogenic. And so, uh, yeah, the more that you have, the more that you put, could potentially get into problem, if in fact there is a problem, which, uh, as I said, is, uh, is under debate. But anyway, yeah, so um, uh, I encourage folks to uh, have relatively small amounts of stuff that they're concerned about. So for example, in the handout on black and yellow birch discusses this, that oil of wintergreen is toxic in large amounts, but if you're just having the amounts that are naturally present in leaves or in twigs, uh, that's uh, basically the same level that you'd find in like wintergreen flavored gum or wintergreen flavored tea that you would buy commercially. So that's a low enough amount to be safe. I have a question. I actually have two questions that are kind of related. So uh, a couple of folks are asking about if they're just starting out in this area with you know, looking for um, plants to forage, what would you right. say are like the top three that are easy to identify and common that they could look for on a walk? And then follow up question, what's just your favorite edible wild plant? Oh, so I didn't get to my favorite edible wild plant because it's uh, in season in September and October. So uh, it's the shagbark hickory. This is what I consider to be the tastiest nut there is. And so I hopefully will expound on that at length if I do a second show later on this season where I cover the, the later summer and the fall plants. Uh, but in terms of uh, easy, you know, for rank beginner wild edibles, um, I would just harvest the plants that you uh, think that you can confidently recognize. Uh, so if you think you've got dandelions down, um, you know, as I said, we've gone past the point, the prime point for dandelions after the flowers are blooming all over the place. But even in a field where you're seeing dandelion flowers all over the place, if you check some of those plants, you should still be able to find some buds on those plants underneath where the flowers are. And that might be a good first thing to try is just those dandelion flower buds. And, um, and then the purslane, this plant right here, uh, I think that's a pretty distinctive looking plant. It's not out yet. It's going to be out in the summer. It's very common. So that might be a good plant to try. And as I said, it's edible raw, it's edible cooked. So there's no big uh, challenge in terms of I got to prepare it just right to, to make it yummy. And, uh, and then the lamb's quarters that I talked about before in the spring. So that's uh, back here. Uh, let me just go back to find that one. Okay, oops, back, no, sorry, I can't remember. Oh, there it was, this one. So um, if you see this whitish dust in the center, and um, one thing I haven't talked about yet is a really good place to go for foraging is organic farms. And I don't want to deter you at all from 
uh, going to the farmstead and buying the wonderfully grown organic food there, getting a CSA share if that'll work for you, because as many edible weeds and invasive species there are, there aren't enough to make a significant dent in our food supply, and we really need to grow uh, our food, and organic is a great way to do it, but organic farms often offer great foraging opportunities, and this is one weed uh, I... Uh, I would say at least four times out of five when I'm at organic farms, I encounter this weed there. And so, um, so you can't just go forage at organic farms without talking to the staff first to make sure it's okay. At least send them an email and ask, uh, but um, they should be fine with it, uh, especially if you can actually help them with the weeding. Um, uh, socially distant, of course, I think they'd really appreciate it. And of course they'd let you take the weeds home that you weeded if they're yummy and nutritious like this one is. And, uh, and then you're forming this symbiotic relationship with your local organic farmer because they have the weeds you want the weed to potentially it's this great partnership. Okay, I wanna uh, reassure everybody that we are probably going to do another program with Russ. We would like to have him at the library in person um, once we reopen, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but was the plan for this, this talk, but obviously that couldn't happen. Um, do we have time for a few more questions or? I have all the time in the world. It's completely up to you. <laughs> all right. Um, we did have someone ask, uh, if you know a good way to prepare skunk cabbage, which is such a beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Skunk I'm cabbage. So, that. um, I have eaten skunk cabbage once. It was served to me by another forager uh, in the Boston area. And I think that she had boiled it, probably had changed the water a couple times. And so I took a bite and it was delicious and it really tasted like cabbage for the first four or five seconds. And then I started to get the aftertaste of the calcium oxalate crystals which are very caustic and they will burn your mouth. And she had successfully cooked this plant to have it be more of a background thing than to be really predominant. So if I didn't know what I was tasting, I could have possibly uh, ignored it. But because I knew it was there and I detected it, I did not uh, eat any more of that skunk cabbage. And I don't teach skunk cabbage and I don't consider it edible, but there are some people that uh, will eat it. It's just not on my list of edible plants. Okay, I have a question. Are all daisies edible? Uh, I can't say for sure. Um, the one that I talked about in my show is the oxide daisy, what I call the she loves me, she loves me not daisy. So the one that you typically see along the roadsides and the vacant, uh, the old farm fields and stuff like that. You know, there are different kinds of daisies like Shasta daisies and other things that people will grow in their gardens they aren't wild plants. So the daisy that grows wild, uh, I've never seen any other daisy that grows wild than this one. There is the poisonous lookalike to this plant called the daisy flea bane, but it's very easy to tell it apart from the oxide daisy if you just remember this. So this is the plant that you can play the game, she loves me, she loves me not, by picking one petal off at a time until you get your answer. To play that game with the daisy fleabane flowers, you would need tweezers to pick individual flower petals off one at a time because they're very, very skinny. So if you're seeing a white flower with a yellow center where the individual white petals are very, very skinny, that is not the edible oxide daisy. All right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between choke cherries and wild cherries? Okay, so that would be later on in my show because that's a later summer thing that we just didn't get to in this show. But um, choke cherries are a variety of wild cherry. We have um, at least four different kinds of wild cherries that grow in Massachusetts, I'm sorry, in New Hampshire. There's the uh, choke cherry, Prunus virginiana. There's uh, the pin cherry, Prunus pennsylvanica. Uh, there's the uh, black cherry, uh, which I did cover in the show today, Prunus serotina, and then there's the non-native uh, bird cherry, Prunus avium, uh, that probably produces the tastiest and largest of our wild cherries that grow in this area. So uh, I'll try and cover that a little bit more in my show that I do later. 
Great. Um, how long can you keep foraged leaves and berries? Oh, it depends what it is. Some things will keep quite a while in the fridge. Like for example, the Dame's Rocket flowers that I showed. So if you pick the flowers, you know, pick the entire stem with the flowers attached to it, and you stick that stem in some water, like in a little vase or a glass uh, jar or, or a drinking glass, and stick it in your fridge, um, those flowers should be fine for at least a week. And then, uh, you know, like uh, other things, um, will keep quite a while, uh, you know, as, as much as a, a garden vegetable, maybe even longer in terms of, you know, if you buy something at the store, it's probably already been in that produce bin for at least a week. And so if you're picking something from the wild, you're getting it very, very fresh. And so the shelf life doesn't start until after you've picked it. So um, maybe it will last a little longer than something you buy at the store. I should tell you that for the uh, vegetables that require cooking, I often will cook something and then freeze it. So for example, the nettles that I covered at the beginning of the show, I typically harvest all the nettles I eat when they're in season in April. And whatever I don't eat right away, I just freeze those steamed nettle greens. And then when I want to eat them later in the year, I just pull out a container out of my freezer and then uh, use it in whatever recipe I'm making. What's the best way to dispose of Japanese knotweed scraps so that they don't re-root? <laughs> okay, so good question. Yeah, so Japanese knotweed is a notoriously invasive plant. And so I have often read that, uh, oh, be very careful where you discard the knotweed pieces that you're not eating because they'll grow roots and sprout into new plants. If that is true, I personally have never seen it. And I've been harvesting this plant for uh, over 40 years. And when I bring a whole bunch of shoots home and I'm peeling them, oh, let's say my knife slips and I cut through a uh, knotweed piece so uh, it, you know, falls apart and I, I'm not going to save that one. So into the compost it goes, you know, with the skin still attached, with the leaves still attached, and supposedly roots can form at the nodes. I just have never seen it myself. And I don't even have a particularly hot compost pile. It's just a big pile of debris where my dandelion plants go and lots of wild edibles, you know, the, the cast offs go in there. And I've never ever seen a knotweed try to sprout in that uh, compost pile. So I, the, the key thing with knotweed that you wanna be extra careful not to gather or disturb in any way are the rhizomes. It's the part of the plant below the surface of the ground. And that part of the plant is not involved at all if you're just harvesting the plant to eat it. So if you, if you don't disturb the roots at all, I don't think you have to worry about spreading knotweed by harvesting it and throwing it in your compost pile when you're done. Um, Russ, we have a couple questions. Just people wondering how you got into foraging. What's your story? Oh, all right. Yeah, sure. So this is uh, explained in the beginning of my book, so you can read it there. But I'll just and it's on my bio page. Uh, so if you, you click through that, uh, so let me go back to my uh, end page here. Thank you. All right, sure. Okay, so here we go. All right, so this URL right here, that's my schedule of my walks, which you'll see, and you'll say, oh. So all these in-person walks are canceled or postponed, and that is unfortunately true. I do have another webinar tomorrow night that, as far as I know, is still open. It's another Zoom-supported webinar. I hope uh, we uh, ha pull it off with less bugs than tonight. But anyway, and that one focuses on native edible species. And then uh, um, and, and there will be more uh, online teaching that will pop up on that web page as as I arrange things with sponsors. But if you go to this link right here and you go uh, to the bottom of that page, you'll see links to other parts of my website, like my bio page, which tells the story of how I got into foraging. But just to make a very brief story, it's when I was a sophomore in high school and my high school biology department outside of Boston offered a mini course called Edible Botany. And I took that class and I got so excited about the subject matter that I went to my town library and I took out every book I could find in the topic and I taught myself over 70 more species. And by senior year of high school, back in the 1970s, I was teaching that same course that I had taken as a sophomore. Uh, 
Uh, what is the difference between a partridge berry and a tea berry? Okay, so a partridge berry, if you look closely at the berry, you'll see that it's got two little belly buttons on there instead of one like a normal berry does. And that's because every partridge berry is formed by two flowers that are fused to the base. So for every two flowers, you get one fruit. So that's why in that slide, you saw that it was called twin flower or twin berry. Let me see if I can find that. So let's see, I think that's going back this way. Yeah, so, all right, yeah, so twin berry, because, and I'm sorry, it doesn't show very well in these slides, but um, every one of those little bees has two little belly buttons on it. And partridge berries have virtually no flavor. And also you see the prominent white midrib on the leaves here in this partridge berry. So that is, um, something that the wintergreen leaves don't have. They don't have that prominent white midrib. So, oops, sorry, let me try and find the wintergreen plant. Uh, I think I'm in the right neighborhood here. Yeah, so this one. All right, see there's no white midrib on these leaves. And these berries right here, these red berries, they have the strong wintergreen flavor. So just nibbling on those berries would say, okay, this is wintergreen and it's not partridge berry, which I said earlier has virtually no flavor. Um, okay, I have a quick question for you, um, but before I ask it, I'm just going to say that I think we'll aim to finish at nine, so we probably have time for one or two more questions. That is um, fine. So actually, let me just answer this question that I'm getting here. Russ, can you go back to your ending slide with your contact information? Yeah, sure. So for everyone else who's curious about the book, um, as Russ mentioned, the store where you can buy it is, the online store is closed, but you can send an email to that email. Um, and purchase it that way. And a quick question for you is, does your book have color photos? No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. So uh, sorry about that. And there is a reason behind that is um, when we got this book published originally in 2004, um, if you wanted to have a book published locally, it was just easier to do it if it was black and white because, uh, and this is still done today, a lot of books that have color photos in them are printed in China. And I really wanted a local printer to get the business of printing this book. And so that's why the photos are in black and white. We do have many field guides at the library that have color photos. So you could check out one of those in conjunction with Russ's book. Um, someone's asking Russ, do you have recommended, you have recommended plant ID books? Um, before you answer that, I will say that my personal favorite app is iNaturalist, which I find works really well um, for plants as well as for wildlife. But I wonder if you have any favorites. Yes. So, so I have used iNaturalist and, um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's an app that you load on your phone and then you can take a picture of something. And then uh, if you don't know what it is, you can have the algorithm guess what it is. And if it's a common plant, it often comes up with the correct answer. But I've seen a considerable number of mistakes. And if you, uh, so, so I'm just mentioning this because me, personally, I would not rely on an app to decide if I were a novice forager, if something has been identified correctly, <laughs> if I were going to put it in my mouth. So, um, uh, you know, this is, this is why, and I realize this is very ironic, uh, especially uh, with things going on the way they are. Uh, and there's this uptick in interest of saying, you know, I should probably know how to forage with the food supply being a little dodgy right now. And my capacity to teach people in person, which would be the best way to learn things, is, you know, um, I'm incapacitated because of the social distancing. So um, uh, it is possible, no promises it is possible that, you know, at some point this year, uh, things will have uh, gotten a little bit better sufficiently that I can get back out in the field again and, and do my on in-person walks or, or other people that do it will be able to do it. Uh, as of right now though, uh, this is, uh, you know, 
your opportunity to learn. Uh, let me just mention one other online source, though, that I consider really good and very, um, it's not one where you post a picture and say, algorithm, what is this? It's where uh, you can post questions and they can get answers. And, uh, and also there's great information posted there if you're pretty sure you know what a plant is. And that's a wonderful website that the Native Plant Trust, which used to be called the New England Wildflower Society maintains called Go Botany. So if you just type Go Botany into Google, you should go there. It's a site I use all the time. And it's also in my native, native edible plant talk I'm giving tomorrow night, um, I'll talk about that site in more detail because it's really useful. If you're wondering, well, what native edible plants can I put in my yard? Uh, that's a great resource to rely on. Great, thank you. Um, Robin, did you have anything else? No, I think it's probably, probably time to wrap it up. Okay, great. Um, well, I'll leave this um, slide just for a minute, Russ, if you don't mind, um, just so sure. people have one last chance to write down um, the contact information for Russ. If we didn't get your questions answered, Russ, can you just tell us quickly, um, when is your talk tomorrow and how could they access it? Oh, all right. So, um, so my screen's still up. So what I'm going to do is just go to my web page, see if this is possible. All right, so this is what my schedule web page looks like. And you see at the oh, top, I have to make this statement. We can't see You're not it, unfortunately. No, sorry. Oh, <laughs> it's not showing up? We were doing so right. well. <laughs> oh, okay, well, that's what happened when we backed out of that, uh, that workaround we had. Okay, so I'm just going to click on the Boston Food Forest Coalition um, information and see what it says there. But um, at least I can try and get the URL for you and at least tell you uh, uh, what it is. Or I might even be able to paste it into my show. So let me well, see. Well, we can just tell uh, people, you know, feel here. free to go to that website and people can yeah. find it there. It's the yeah. Boston Food Forest Coalition. And if you uh, just, uh, oh, you know what it's trying to do? It's, tr <laughs> it's trying to launch the Zoominar for tomorrow's talk which is oh, not goodness. until tomorrow. So let's get <laughs> out of there. So that's not going to happen. All right. So uh, anyway, let me just close this window. All right. So there we are. So uh, I can type on this slide, I bet, right here. Uh, so let's do this. Okay. And let me just put it on this slide right here. I didn't get a chance to tell my joke. Let's just do this. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So this is your URL, so get rid of that. Okay. <laughs> so it is called the All right, so that's what to look for. And um uh, and then, yeah, under events, you should find the event and you should be able to uh, uh, sign up for that talk. Great. Thank you. Um, and I want to call out one other thing, which is that um, Jennifer, who has been very helpful in the chat answering questions, she has suggested a local foraging group for New Hampshire on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, check out NH Wildcraft and Foraging. That's NH oh, I didn't know about Wildcraft that one. and Foraging. Okay. Yeah, sounds pretty oh, cool. Oh, interesting. Well, thank you so, so much, Russ. This was totally awesome. We appreciate everybody's patience, including yours. Well, I, I you know, uh, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that, I hope people got some stuff out of this and I'm really sorry we, about all the glitches, but uh, maybe we'll do better if we do our uh, summer and fall version of the show uh, later on this year. Great, and please, everybody who attended, um, if you're local to the area, visit our website under the About section. You can sign up for our newsletter, which is once a month, and you'll see all of the upcoming programs at the library. So those of you who are interested in mushrooms, we heard you loud and clear. We will make sure to pursue that option soon. And um, we've got a lot of other good stuff coming up online. Um, so thank you, everyone, for attending.
and I think we'll end it there. Okay, very good. Good night, everybody. All right, good night.